Uh, here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to finish up a short teaching on the armor of God. Then Gordon and I are going to set up here two chairs, and we're going to be giving testimonies and stories and accounts of deliverances. We're going to tell you what we've experienced firsthand with casting out demons. It's going to be kind of an exciting program today, isn't it? Yeah. So I've got a bunch of stories to tell. I'll have to select the ones that I feel the Spirit of God wants me to share, and same with Dr. Gordon. So it's going to be a fun time. All right, here we go. You grab your outlines, pretty much the same outline you had last time, only we're not going to go very long this time. We found out, first of all, our strength was in Christ, right? Be strong in the Lord, Lord and the power of His might. So who's fighting the battle? The Lord is fighting the battle, right? So our strength is in the Lord, which is really powerful because we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. Jesus, when He rose from the dead, did the triumphant. What's the triumphant? That's a Greek term. It's interesting. It's really a picture of the Roman army coming home from battle, and they did what they loved, parades. Romans loved parades. So they'd go through the streets of Rome with what they called the triumphant. The captain of the army or the head of the army, the general, whatever, would be at the front, and then all the soldiers would march, and then at the end of the uh, army would be the captors. And they'd always keep a certain number of the captors, and they'd chain them together, and they would drag them through the streets of Rome as a great demonstration of the power of the Roman army. Well, that's the word Paul chose with reference to Christ's resurrection. He led a triumphant through the heavenlies. Remember, we're talking about the second and third heavens here. Uh, I'm not going to spend time reviewing much, but just to say that Jesus, when He rose from the dead, triumphed over Satan. And what He did is He went from this earth, all right, He died on the cross, went into the grave, took the Old Testament saints, we weren't, uh, they were in paradise, but they were earthbound at the time, and He led them through the second heavenlies. Now remember we talked about the fallen angels dwell in the heavenlies, Ephesians 6, essentially the second heavens, and then the third heaven, the third heaven is above the second heaven. I can add that far. <laughs> if there's a second heaven, there's a third. That looked like B, right? Um, there's a third heaven. So the first heavens is the firmament. The second heavens are the heavenly places where the angels, fallen angels dwell, as well as Michael. Remember they were fighting or, or in the prayer of Daniel in this realm. And so Jesus led the triumphant through through the second heavenlies, and He made a demonstration, a show, openly, of the defeat of the fallen angels. So they were the captors that were normally brought behind the Roman army and drugged through the streets of Rome. The pictures were the demons and the fallen angels. Now remember, we're talking about demons on earth, fallen, fallen angels in heavens, but demons on earth, disembodied spirits, we believe from the flood, these disembodied spirits were on the earth looking for places to dwell. These are earthbound. These evil spirits, filthy spirits, demons, Jesus called them, uh, they're, they're earthbound. And then the fallen angels are here. And then Revelation 12, we know that Satan and all the fallen angels are cast out of that realm during the great tribulation and cast on earth. So just an overview real quickly of this because Jesus led the triumphant. We're not fighting for victory. He's already defeated, Dr. John. Already defeated, right? Right, Dr. John? Already, uh, right, Dr. Well, we got a bunch of doctors here this morning. Yeah. I, I'm not going to be intimidated, all right? Because um, I'm a doctor too, right? <laughs> okay. He, we're already fighting from victory. So, remember last time, just real quickly, principalities and powers made a show of them openly. So Jesus rose from the dead, sat in the heavenlies, and placed under His feet all principalities and powers. And then according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, He took His fullness, His power, His resurrection glory, His triumphant march, all the power of heaven, He took it and gave it back to the church. So we have been given... See, just like He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, we are the fullness of Jesus bodily. It says that in Ephesians 1. 
his body, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. See, I'm the fullness of Jesus bodily. I'm just do a quick review, just not even five minutes review. So we learned all this. Then we found out that on this earth, now we're given armor. It's talked about in Ephesians 6. Now we only really take part of the armor. The first three parts of the armor, it says having these things. You don't have to take on your breastplate of righteousness. You already have it. You don't have to put on the girdle of truth. It's already on. It's on. It says, having the, having the girdle of truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You don't have to take those armors on. They're yours. That, remember, we're dealing with a doctrine here called the doctrine of identity? Identification in Christ. Who you are already? You are already full, filled, covered with the righteousness of Christ. God sees you in your spirit man. We talk a lot about the spirit man, and you got to define what that is, so you're not new age. <laughs> Our spirit man. I was looking at, by the way, I was looking at a video, and they were just rebuilding CERN. You know that? CERN wasn't big enough. So they're now raising billions of dollars and making a cauldron collider bigger than CERN. Because they say they want to discover the fifth dimension. They believe if they can get two particles going to the speed of light and hitting each other in this cauldron collider over in Switzerland, that they will unlock a secret of the universe. And they were interviewing this gentleman that now is heading up the, the building of this larger cauldron collider. And so this in 17 mile one isn't big enough. They're hoping to discover what we already know. We already know the fifth dimension. I walk in it. I was in it this morning. I was speaking in the fifth dimension language. Yeah. Called tongues. Mm -hmm. you, you move in the fifth dimension, Gordon. Mm -hmm. You're a fifth dimension man. Mm -hmm. Most of everything you do is spirit led. Mm -hmm. And you say the terms all the time. God revealed this. We move in revelation upon this rock. You say, Gordon, you're kind of, you're bringing that truth to Kingdom Life University. On this rock, is the church built? What's the church? What's the rock? Revelation. The rock of revelation. Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this, but my spirit revealed this. And then Jesus said, it's that rock of revelation that my church is going to be built on. Uh, don't you like Kingdom Life University? We are all about revelation. That's right. We're all about moving in the spirit realm. We're all about teaching people how to move in the spirit man. The spirit man is the spirit part of you that comes to life when Jesus redeems you by his blood. The Holy Spirit indwells you and brings life in your spirit. We call that the spirit man. Under the authority of the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we teach people at KLU how to move in the fifth dimension man. So this is very important. So all this is background. Now, we looked at the breastplate of righteousness. Man, you get me on the righteousness of Christ, and it's one of the most exciting subjects in the world because it's the foundation of the kingdom of God. Yes. It's His righteousness. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and built on His righteousness is all revelation. You don't need to know what to do. You just look at G. Well, you need to know what to do. You need to know His will through the righteousness of Christ. So our, our vision, our goal is to help restore to the church the message, the apostolic calling of the faith found in Ephesians 4. What is the faith? It's the gospel of the righteousness of Christ alone. We've left the faith largely in many churches. Going to another gospel, which is really not the gospel, Paul said. So he, this is exciting stuff. We're walking on the, age of uh, on the edge of revelation constantly. In our science, I don't know of another science department of any university in the world that's based on revelation. And you know what this lady said? There were two, there's a gentleman and a lady that were being interviewed about CERN. They said, we believe we're going to discover something 
with this new cauldron collider that will cause a paradigm shift in science. Yeah. I thought science was built on fact. They said, we're running on old, old formulas. We need a new formula. Well, I'll tell you the formula. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. By him were all things created in heaven and earth, and he is before all things, and by him all things are held together. I'm flying from my mom's funeral in Phoenix, and I land in Dallas, and, and, and I'm sitting at the airport and just praying in the spirit and witnessing to people as I get a chance, and God gives me a download. And he says, Jerry, he said, the future, and this is before we went into our science in our university, he said, the future is quantum physics. And he says, the hydrogen atom is going to be the future of all energy. And I thought, wow. So I went home and I started researching online, and actually there's some new research. You may want to, you know, we don't have time to get into this. You have to teach another session of this. But if you vary... See, one of the simplest proton, or one of the simplest elements in all of creation is a hydrogen atom. If you can shift those elements just a little bit, it creates so much heat that you can drive an automobile for a full month on one cell of hydrogen energy. Wow. You can heat a house. Wow. So we're getting into that science now. Amen? And so, uh, oh, you get me all excited here. So I'm just saying, we, we are on the edge of something really wonderful and great and just unlocking the secrets of the universe because they're all hidden in Christ. Everything we need to know is in Him. Most often used phrase in Ephesians, in Him. Say, I am in Him. In Him I am. Live, move, and have my being. I can do all things through Him. You are tied in, folks, with the big idea called God's destiny, called kingdom of God. You're tied in with the big idea that God had of bringing all of this under His rulership. Now, he allowed Satan to take over a pretty good portion of this earth. I don't believe the devil is God of this world. He's the God of the world system. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the church, it's our responsibility to bring the earth back under the rulership of him. And that's what we're in training for. See, I'm in training for reigning. I'm getting ready to position myself for eternal rule with Christ. That's why I'm here for 80 years. I'm putting myself in position of His kingdom by my faithfulness here. I don't know, 80 short years is a good investment to get 100 billion years in return or more. 80 plus, 80 plus, <laughs> come on, 80 plus, yeah. what, 74 is, is the new middle age? Not, yeah, I just turned middle age this month, I'm turning middle age. Thanks, Keith. All right, so here we have it, the armor of God, the armor of God. We have the breastplate of righteousness, we have our loins girt about with truth, and the truth is found in the what? The word of God, all right, thy word is truth. You can trust this, can't trust this, can't trust this. The five senses, you've got to trust the word. So we have the armor, and we looked last week, and we'll finish this up here shortly, and then we're going to get into some stories of deliverance. Then we have the shield of faith. Now, now these you take on. You take the shield of faith. The other ones you have. Now you take the shield of faith. And you're going to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Satan has a threefold ministry. Oh, by the way, he's in full-time ministry. <laughs> he just shifted the ministry from worship in heaven, and exalting the God of heaven, 
to his own ministry. It's to kill, still, and destroy. That's his mission statement. And he's got a bunch of people helping him, all these fallen angels and all these demons are on his side, although I personally feel like sometimes God gives me a little bit of a vision into the kingdom of darkness to see what it looks like. There is so much anger and hate and jealousy and bitterness and, and destruction in that kingdom. I'm, I'm in against the, each other. I think if Satan had his way, his, his way, he'd kill all the demons. He just hates everything. His whole being is hatred and murder and killing and destroying. And so that's his kingdom. So we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of, our, of, his, of God's beloved son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're about. So we take the shield of faith, quench the fiery darts. Then we take the helmet of salvation. I'm telling you, the enemy wants to attack our brain. He wants to attack our thoughts. By the way, I'm going back through the book of Philippians. I love Philippians. You know why? Because it's about the mind. It's about the mind. I mean, the whole, whole Philippians is right thoughts bring right relationships, and right relationships bring joy. The whole book of Ephesians is about joy. Let this mind be in you, which was also in. So we have the what? See, I have the mind of Christ. You've already... Your spirit man has already been downloaded 100% of the mind of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Think of that. Yeah. Peter says, inside of you dwelleth everything you need for life and godly, godliness through Christ Jesus. Hey, you've got it all. Say, I've got it all. Got it Just got to get to it. Yeah. So what we learn, the, the flesh, the, net, the old man, the old nature, the old mindsets, all war against the spirit man. Every day you're in a battle over, over who's going to rule, the spirit man or your flesh. Paul said if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what, what do you do? You focus you, your life on the spirit man. Get out of that flesh man. All right, we don't want to go there very long. So the helmet of salvation. The sword of the Spirit. Now, that's our offensive weapon. That's our offensive weapon. Man, the power of the Word. Remember what we learned about Reinhard Bunke when he was in Africa. God gave him a revelation. He, he had 47 converts after three years. Was discouraged. Told his wife, pack your bags, you're going back to Germany. God didn't call me to Africa. And a good wife, how many know a good wife can keep you focused? <laughs> She said, Reinhardt, are you telling me we move our whole family down from Germany to Africa and you're telling me we're leaving? She said, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I did this for you. I came to Africa for you. You do this for me. He said, what, 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 are, you, what are you asking? She said, you fast and pray three days. And she said, if God says go home to Germany after three days of fasting and prayer and seeking God, then I'll go. I, wanna, I, won't, I won't ask any questions. And you know what? He said, after th he said the first day, heaven was like brass. How many know sometimes you just seek God, things get worse? He said, the second day, heaven was like brass. He said, on the third day, how many, how many believe in the third day? <laughs> Something happened on the third day. I don't know what it is about three days, but on the third day, he said, the presence of God showed up in Africa. God gave him a download, and here's what God told him. Reinhardt, my word in your mouth has the same authority as my word in my mouth. That's what God told him. He says, you've been speaking nothing but quit, discourage, depression. I'm over. I'm finished. I'm done. I wasn't called. He said, change your mouth. Switch it over now to this. He said, man, I got a vision of a blood brought Africa. He said, I saw the blood of Jesus go across Africa. He's had over a million people in some of his meetings. I'm sure glad he didn't leave. Didn't follow his emotions, his feelings, his flesh. Thank God for a good wife that put it to him. So God's word in our mouth has the same power as God's word in his mouth. 
because the Word mixed with the Spirit brings life. All right, so here we have it. Now we finish off with this, this phrase. And if, let's go back to Ephesians real quickly. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we want to have some stories of deliverance today. All right. What did Paul tie it all together with? All right. Here it is. Let's see. Go to Ephesians. All right. Ephesians chapter 6. Try to take your Bibles. And here it is. Paul finishes off the book. One of my favorite books. If you don't enjoy Ephesians, man, you just, you're just out there. It is rich. It is full of rich. It's rich. Okay. Uh, so he says here, praying. Okay, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching, watching to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So how do we end this warfare? With what? What's prayer? What's prayer? Well, it's a multitude of things. I, I, I believe it can be intercession. It can be, uh, I actually believe there are five different elements to prayer. I won't go into all those right now. But I believe intercession and supplication and thanksgiving, all these are elements. Listening is part of prayer. Just being still and hearing what God's saying. That's part of prayer. God downloads you during prayer. I was up the other morning. I hope I didn't bug the family. I got, I got my man cave. And I put some worship music on. I put the uh, Alberto and Kimberly Rivera on there with a beautiful orchestra background. And just, they just bring me into the presence of the Lord because they are ministering in the Spirit all the time in worship. And uh, if you don't download their stuff, you need to. It's, it's awesome. And I, play, I always play it at the end of our study here when we have some prayer time. Because I tell you what, worship puts you into, into that presence of the Lord. Amen. We learned that on the streets of San Francisco, that worship is warfare. It is. Worship is warfare. Yep. Right? Yes. Worship gives you the heaven's mindset. What worship does is transition you from here to here in the spirit. So when you're worshiping, you begin to see things differently. You see things from heaven instead of from earth. Elevated with a dimension. <gasps> Ooh, you're good, Keith. You, you, yeah. You, you know that old guy on the radio that used to be Amy and Charlie? Remember that old Bible teacher? I don't know who it was, but he had Amy and Charlie with him right beside him, you know? You're my Amy and Charlie. I like it. All right. So, <laughs> you know, the guy would say something. I think he'd always poke the guy, and the Amy and Charlie say, Amen. You know, anyway, that was getting back to the good old Baptist days. So, what worship does is give you a divine perspective of the earth. Yeah, now you know how to pray. Because the only thing God promises to bless is praying in His will. When you pray in His will, you pray with confidence, boldness. When you know what God says. See, Elijah knew enough of the Old Testament that God said if, they, if Israel ever turned after other gods, that he would shut off the rain. That's what God said to Israel. If you follow other gods, I will not cause it to rain up on your land. So all Elijah was doing was enforcing on Mount Carmel or in the land. He wasn't coming up with this idea. Well, I, just, I think I'm just going to keep the rain from coming on Israel because they deserve to come back to God. He, did, I wasn't, he saw in the Word what God said. So if we know what God says in His Word, we know how to pray in His will. And when we know how to pray in His will, we, what is prayer? One of the purposes of prayer is to shift kingdoms. Has somewhat to do with apostolic. We don't want to go there right now. One of the purposes of prayer is to shift kingdoms. For example, James is martyred. Looks like the church is really going downhill under Herod. 
Herod is this one big time jerk. He, as far as he's concerned, he's just going to listen to the high priest and all that. He'll kill all the Christians. He, he. So Herod said, well, let's, it looked good with James. Everybody, oh man, the high priests are really excited about that. So let's get Peter and throw him into jail. So they took Peter, put him in prison or jail. And it says in Acts 12 that the church began to pray continually. Amen. They began to pray continually. The and they prayed Peter out of prison. And they prayed Herod to worms. Look at the end of chapter 12 of Acts. Herod was eaten up with worms. So if you got a bad leader, see God, it's God's will to have good government over nations. Why? So there'll be a peace and quietness and so that you will be able to share the gospel. See, we have not gotten completely down in our hearts and our minds the power of prayer. We play with it. Like, you know, it's a good idea if you're sick or if somebody has a need or if you're, you can't make your house payment at the end of the month, let's have a prayer meeting. Come on. The church is, is to shift kingdoms on this earth. I, I was listening to Derek Prince again. I, I always listen to his tapes before I come over here. I get all charged up. He's one of my favorite all-time teachers. And he said he was over in Kenya years ago, and he, went, he was at a youth conference over there. And Kenya was coming under tremendous influence of the communists. And he, he said, I, I had a vision in the morning of a red horse riding into Kenya, taking over the nation Kenya. So he said, I went into this youth conference and I told these young people what I had seen, that, that, that Kenya was going to come under communism unless they prayed. And he said, those young people, he said, I have never been in a prayer meeting like this prayer meeting. He said, those young people got a hold of the throne of God and prayed and prayed, he said, with such authority and power. Because it's God's will that we have good government, according to 1 Timothy. It's God's will that we pray for those in authority so we'll live in peace. Why is Donald Trump in office? You did it. You caused that mess up there in Washington. That poor swamp is stinking worse every day. Just needs drain, right? <laughs> hey, we are the ones that pray Donald Trump. There's no reason he should be there. There's not a human reason that man should be in office. It was prayer that put him there. Because God is dealing with... Now, aren't you glad God's beginning to deal with Hollywood? I mean, it used to be common knowledge that these producers would sleep with these young actresses and all this stuff, and they, it was just a polluted mess out there. And now they're all, all these women are coming forth and bringing one of the top guys in all of Hollywood to accountability. Right, Is God dealing with Hollywood? Yeah. Is God dealing with our government? Yeah. There has to be somebody in America that's praying this into action. Yeah. We have power in prayer, Gordon. We can literally move mountains in prayer. You know the story of Reese Howe. He had that little school of prayer in England during the Second World War. And they'd get up every morning, and it was just a few people, probably not many more than we have here. You know who won the Second World War? The prayer school of Reese Howe in England. Of course, nations will take credit for it. God would show them how to pray that the Germans would get all their vehicles stuck in the middle of the desert because it snowed. It's <laughs> exactly what happened. They'd read about it three days. Read Reese Howe's book, The Intercessor. They'd pray, and then three days later, they'd read it in the newspaper exactly what they prayed. And they were literally bringing down Hitler and the Nazis through prayer. It was prayer that literally turned that nation around. And turned, turned the war around, I should say. See, once we get a hold of the authority that God has given us on earth, because God, God can do this in heaven in a minute with a stroke of a finger and all his hosts of angels could change everything down here. But he said, nope. 
if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. See, there's a formula that God has, and it's prayer. Prayer changes things, changes nations. So I'm up doing battle. I'm up battling in this prayer thing the other morning. I just got going in the spirit. And when you start praying in the spirit with worship, you got to watch out. It goes all kinds of directions, you know. This thing starts in, in with authority. And I felt the authority. And I was commanding governments. And I was command. In fact, you know what? I, I was reading a story of a great, I'm trying to, I think it was Lester Sumrall. Yeah, it was his ministry. He had a big map of the world. And somebody was following Lester Summerall around in his latter, latter years, a young man. He said, I just want to find out what makes this man tick and why he has so much influence in the nations and, and why God is so greatly using him around the world, what, what is happening. And, and, and he watched him. He said, one day I went into, he said he had this place in his church, Lester's church, he said where there were columns. And he said, I went and hid behind one of the columns. And Lester Summerall didn't know I was there. And he said, I watched this man of prayer stand in front of a world map. And he began to command governments. God would show him how to pray over governments and what to speak over the government, what to declare, what to pronounce. Because what he was, ooh, I'm getting chills. You know what? Lester Sumrall was releasing the kingdom of God to earth. If we'll, if we'll move in this stuff, folks, if we'll pick up this torch of prayer, God will shift kingdoms. Don't criticize the government. Pray. Criticism does nothing but release negative energy in, in the trees. Wonder why your trees in your backyard are dying? Start speaking life. Go get into the presence of the Lord. God, how do I pray for this nation? What do I say for Canada? What do I say? How do I pray for Mexico? What do, what do I pray for these countries? Tell me. Show me your will. And I'll pray it. Because it's us who release it. And with this, I'll finish. Now, remember, in Revelation chapter 6, it's the prayers of the saints that release the seals on the earth. Prayers of the saints, it says. In Revelation 8, it's the prayers of the saints that release the trumpets in the tribulation. Do we have authority or what? Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 10 when the 70 returned. Because they were amazed. They were surprised at the transmitted authority they were operating under. He said, even the demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus. We were, just, we were surprised. Because Jesus sent the 70 into every city and place where he was going to come. What did they do? I believe they pulled down strongholds over the cities. Because if you look at the action of the verb in verse 18, it's, uh, Jesus said, while you 70 were going, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He said, I was observing in the spirit world where you 70 were going, I was watching the power of heaven fall. Hello? Do you have a little thing? And then the next verse, one of my favorite in the, in the entire Bible. Have I not given you authority on earth to tread on serpents? And over all, oh, and scorpions. Let's throw some scorpions in there too, all right? And over all the power of the enemy. And don't get hung up with a lot of fear if you do this. They're not going to retaliate. Who is he that will harm you? If you be a doer of that which is good. When you are in spiritual warfare, you're walking under divine covering. You've got hosts of angels around. You've got two big angels to your back, probably with swords drawn. Come on. We're mighty warriors for the kingdom. And it's our opportunity on this earth to release heaven on earth. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. See, he already rules up here. We just got to get him ruling down here.